Welcome back Troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. I've got a really special episode for you guys today. So I mainly focus on like 70s, 80s, and modern day Gibsons because that's what's more affordable and I am really passionate and knowledgeable about those models. But today we are going to document a true 50s black beauty. That's right, this review is made possible by Jim over at Jam City Guitars. He's a small drive for me, but he let me borrow this 1957 Gibson Les Paul Custom. That's right, this is the Jimmy Page guitar. I know there's a lot of guys who use three pickup Black Beauties, but what comes to my mind first is Jimmy Page's. Now his was actually 1960, it got stolen I think around 1970 and eventually made its way back to him. And another one you might think of is like Peter Frampton's three pickup Black Beauty, but you gotta remember, his was actually a 1954, so it originally had the staple pickup and P90 in the bridge position and that got routed out. That's kind of an interesting piece, you can learn more about that one in this episode. But for today, Today, we are going to document this beautiful first year of issue Black Beauty Les Paul Custom. So as far as Les Paul standards go, it was like this. It was a gold top with the trapeze tailpiece, then we moved to the wrap tails, and then eventually get the ABR1 bridge, and then you get the introduction of the humbuckers, and then you get the burst finish. That's how the Les Paul standard goes. As far as the customs go, it was those Alnico ones that we were talking about earlier, the staple pickup ones, and then you moved on to this. Now occasionally you can find some custom colors, but most of them are black. But the few rare cherry ones that are out there are pretty sweet as well. And you can also find a couple of two pickup ones. I mean, again, true vintage is not my expertise, but but this is a beautiful piece that we can document today. So it's got all the great patina that you would want, but this is also a factory Bigsby example. Now apparently the guy at Heritage Auctions thought this Bigsby was factory original. However, Jim and I, we were like, eh, I don't think we've ever seen a nickel one stocked with the gold hardware, but I guess if they were really low on parts or if maybe somebody custom ordered it that way, but it's more likely that Bigsby has been replaced. And we'll have to see on the workbench if it actually did start as a factory Bigsby, but I'm not seeing any of the stop bar tailpiece holes, so I do believe so. We've got our count it. One, two, three humbucker pickups in here, and these aren't just any humbuckers, it's the originals, the PAFs. You know, each one of these is worth more than your high-end guitar, right? But my first impressions holding this thing, you know, in person, you know, when I'm alone in a room, I can actually take some time to bond with this thing is, it's cool. It's got so much history. It's got a smell to it. Like if you've ever felt a vintage guitar from like the 50s and 60s, they have a certain smell to it. It's not a good or a bad smell. It's just, you know, a certain scent to them. But what I really noticed is how thin the neck is. So it's not like a 57 Les Paul standard where the neck might be a little bit bigger. I mean, this is a very slim neck and the frets are almost not even there. And that's right, my friends, these are true fretless wonders, the original frets on these things. So a lot of people think their 70s Norland era ones are called fretless wonders. They're not. These are. And the big thing is these are low and skinny frets. The Norland ones are low and wide. So they do a similar thing, but bending on these frets, a little bit difficult, but it's great for some jazzy stuff. And this thing's got some pretty good heft to it as well. And obviously, beautifully aged, it's got wear and tear. We can take a look at that on the workbench, but overall, it is in good shape. It is for sale. If you're interested in it, you can check it out over on his website, Jam City Guitars. And when I went to pick this thing up, I brought a chainsaw case with me because these 50 cases, I mean, they're pretty worn, they're old, so I thought, ah, oh, I can transport it in that, but he just cut me a, a pool noodle in here to make that a little bit more secure so I could take the yellow case with me because that's such an iconic look right here. This is exactly what they try to reissue when they do reissues, that whole black and gold combo. It's just such a cool sight. So to learn more about the Jimmy Page Les Paul Custom, let's go ahead, throw this thing on the workbench and take an individual look at its parts and specs. Inside the 1957 Les Paul Black Beauty. Did you guys ever think I would say that and put one of these on the bench? So I made the executive decision that this is not my guitar, so I'm not going to clean it. I just lightly dusted it off so we can just appreciate the patina that is on it. Because I'm sure there's some buyers out there of vintage pieces that want that still under there. They want the gunk underneath the pickguard. Let's go ahead and take a look at these pickups. 
So here it is, the Holy Grail pickup, the 50s Gibson PAF that everything has tried to base off of ever since the beginning because this is the sound of classic rock and roll. The cover has some pretty cool aging to it, from the strings rubbing up against it to a player's hands rubbing off the gold. Got quite a bit of wear on our middle pickup, but all things considered, this one's not really all that worn. Your bridge pickup's looking just fine, despite the pickup ring itself getting kind of beat up. I've noticed some guys that try to relic guitars have been trying to mimic that effect. But let's go ahead and take a look at our neck cavity. So there we can see the long neck tenon. Seems a bit more rounded than what you see on reissues. Kind of cool to see for the first time. But hey, check that out. You can also see the maple block in your neck right there. That caps off the truss rod cavity. But here's another cool difference between the standards and the customs. The customs actually utilize mahogany tops, which I believe is what we're seeing right there. Unfortunately, the middle pickup, I'm not able to remove that one due to a strip screw. And again, it's not my guitar. I'm not going to mess around too much with that. But we can see our bridge pickup cavity route. You can see a little bit of mahogany color going through there. And we'll take a quick look at this PAF. Another cool thing to see is this appears to be grounded off at the bridge posts right there. So they just wrap that around our pickup lead right there, and then that just all gets connected within our control cavity. Those tiny little holes are for, but you see that on both sides of the bridge cavity. But our pickups within the circuit, 7.34k ohms in the bridge. Middle position just for fun, 3.7 and the neck is 7.26. Now, if you're curious why that middle position is like half as much, is that pickup going bad? No, the way these three pickup Les Paul customs are wired, it's these two in kind of an out of phase sound. It essentially makes it sound like a single coil, you know, Stratocaster-esque, but it was a very common mod for people to just rewire these so it's three volumes and then you can blend. Like for example, check out the Mickey Baker Master Tone model. That was a real 50s model, but I've documented a reissue if you wanna see how that was done. Now let's check out our bridge system. You're going to notice this actually has two thumb wheels on it. I don't believe it leaves the factory stock like that. That's just a very common modification on these. Because if you don't, the posts can start to lean. So that just helps secure that. And then you use this to adjust the height of the bridge. And of course the bridge is the ever famous and lusted after Gibson ABR1. Just this bridge is worth quite a bit of money. So the way to tell if a guitar has had a Bigsby on it is right here. This is what they call the snake bite. A hole right here and a hole right there because that's what you use to secure this Bigsby to the top. Two screws right here and there. Now if somebody were to install a stop bar tailpiece, it would go right here. So sometimes this one will get hidden, but that one is usually visible. They call that the snake bite. But since we don't have any stop bar studs, that's how we know this one left the factory like that in a stock. Now, whether this is the exact Bigsby, I guess we can't really 100% prove it, but being nickel is a little bit strange, but hey, that's what it is. Who knows, maybe somebody actually went as far as like removing the gold plating on it at one point in time. We might as well take a second to appreciate this, the Bigsby branding. The way they secure the arm to this is a little bit different than the modern ones we've seen. There's like some sort of a, a red cap. I'm not sure if that's original or if that's something somebody added to boist this up a little bit more. But this spring is great. You know, the vintage Bigsby's, they've had time to have their springs worn in so they're not as, you know, finicky with their tuning. And then the way these things work is you put the ball end of the string right here, you wrap it around the back, and then this is a tension bar. The string has to run under there. And then that goes over the bridge. And then you can get a light warble effect because this bar then moves those little nubs. As far as the plastics on this thing, they're definitely very aged because you can see where the poker chip's actually kind of bending itself up, but you've got a cool amber switch tip, which I definitely associate with these three pickup Les Ball Customs. They're pretty cool. Another thing is the strap button is not actually like flush with the body, like it was drilled in at a slight angle and it appears to be factory that way. But you've got the same phenomenon going on with our pick guard. It's got a little bit of a up curve right there. But it's definitely fun to see the backside of one of these things. And note the domed screw head right there. Most modern production ones are just completely flat. We'll just kind of run this along the light so you can really appreciate the top carve and some of the age that this thing has. Nice dish carve to it. Got some good aging to these knobs as well. With the thumb bleeders. Extra pokey because they're vintage. And of course, all the goo underneath the pick guard here. You can tell this one has not had a deep clean. So there we go. That is the body. It's all mahogany. But now we move on to the mahogany neck, the ebony fretboard.
That's another feature that made a custom more expensive than a standard back in the day. However, the vintage market has decided that customs are less valuable than standards. Like, these are relatively affordable. Like, you normally don't even break six figures on one of these things. You're in the mid to high fives. But premium features include the ebony fretboard, the real mother of pearl inlays. You get the multi multi multiply binding not only on the front, but also on the back of these things. And obviously, your fancy headstock logo. All things considered, this board's not in too bad of shape. You get a little bit of shrinkage in these areas. And you can see a few chipped areas around the inlays, but nothing too crazy. A lot of times with the action being so low, people with long fingernails will kind of gouge up your fretboard. So this is not looking too bad. I think if you polished up these frets, you probably wouldn't even see most of this light fretware that's even on here. The fret nibs on vintage models are extremely small. Like they are minuscule as compared to what you see on like Gibson USA today. Even the custom Custom shops are a lot larger than these, but they do appear to be the original frets. However, the nibs are definitely a little bit more worn as you go up the neck because I mean this is, it's almost a completely rounded edge. Somebody definitely played this thing in. Now I understand why guys do that on modern day guitars because these vintage ones, I mean they have a pretty good feel to them. And this is something that I've always known from historics, but it's cool to see this on a vintage original. You've got your tortoise shell side marker inlays. They don't always look tortoise shelly unless you get them in the light just right. That first one's a good example of that. And you can also see just how rolled over the edge of this fretboard is. And you can also see you've got some edge wear right here where the finish has kind of been worn in on a few areas. But for the most part, I would say all the finish is intact. I mean, just look how low that action is though. I mean, it's like almost too uncomfortably low. I mean, this is meant for like jazzy stuff right here. I could raise it up, but being the fretless wonder frets that these are, I mean, this is pretty much right where you want to be. Our scale length is 24 and 3 quarter inches. It appears we have a nylon nut that measures 1.66, and by the 12th fret that increases to 2.06. Got a first fret neck depth of 0.89, and that increases to 0.97 by the 12th. So those measurements might make it seem a little bit large, but this is a rather thin feeling neck, but it's got some roundedness to it. Here's what that neck profile looks like at the first fret and the 12th fret. Just a nice rounded C shape. As far as our headstock goes, this is just a beauty. Your truss rod's really sunken down in there, but that's got tons of life left. You still have your original tuners on this one. Maybe a little bit of chipping of the lacquer right there. The rest of them are looking pretty stellar here. And of course, your custom block logo. A little bit thinner than the modern day ones. Then you get that cool Gibson 50s logo. This is kind of the logo that Gibson was trying to replicate in like the prehistoric era, except for they came out even a little bit more goofy than that, but such a cool looking headstock here. But the real treat is the truss rod cover itself. I've actually never seen one of these. Like I've seen the historic style that are like blank, but it's got that nice white beveled edge right here and then the upper black layer, but you can see those lines right there. Those are roller lines. Apparently those are left over from the machine that would roll these things out. So whenever you get like those expensive $80 replica parts that have these little lines on it, yeah, it's because the originals have it. It's just supposed to make it look fancy, but it reads Les Paul Custom and the back is just white. Before we flip over to the backside, a couple of other cool things I saw while stringing this thing up. The yellow that we saw by the chipped paint, I believe that's actually the holly veneer showing underneath it. So a lot of the high-end Gibsons actually use a Hollywood veneer that this is on top of, but like a Les Paul Jr. or something would not have that. We saw something very similar to that in the inside of this truss rod cavity as well, if you remember seeing that. And then since this lacquer is so old and aged, it's actually kind of fell into the pores of the mahogany body. We've been talking about this a lot lately on Gibson guitars, but it's just kind of something apparently that they've done ever since the beginning. Now some of this is just, you know, it's the aged finish falling into the pores and whatnot. That certainly gives this thing an interesting vibe. Now let's move over to the backside, starting with our control cavity. Everything looks stock to me in here. But then again, I haven't seen many of these things in person. But all the solder joints look good to me, and that's what Jim thought as well. So I was always curious, do these have mahogany tops or are they just all mahogany? What I'm seeing right here leads me to believe that it's a top. However, there also appears to just be a ridge around that entire area where they routed out, so I could just be misled right there. But I believe the industry professionals call these the phone book capacitors. But I really like the shininess of the mahogany right here. It's got a little bit of like figuring dancing to it. 
So I mean, just imagine this thing in a natural finish. But here's what our toggle switch cavity looks like. We've got lots of worming and scratches on the back of this one, but you know, for as old as it is, it's not in too bad of shape. Like half of that stuff would polish off, but like some of the deeper scratches, yeah, maybe not so much on those guys. Moving up the backside of the neck, you can definitely see this thing was played, maybe with a ring on. Thankfully though, you really don't feel any of this while you're playing. They're very minor marks on the back. And I was curious how these 50s Cluson waffle backs would feel, because the 70s waffle back tuners, they might be the coolest looking tuners ever made, but they're trash. And honestly, I don't have that high of hopes for these 50s ones. <laughs> Some of them feel a little bit loose, like they still work, but it's definitely not my favorite tuner I've ever felt. But we can read our serial number on this one, dating it to 1957. Looks like number 8526. And uh-oh, we've got a chip up here at the top of the headstock. But thankfully, that's on the treble side, so you don't see that while you're playing it. So that's always a plus. Can't forget a blacklight test on a true vintage guitar. I kind of stopped doing these for the modern ones because, I mean, what are we really looking for here when they're brand new guitars? But this thing being from 57, Right away, something interesting. So I was looking at these marks earlier and I thought, okay, I bet those are just small touch-ups of some finished breaking dings. But no, blacklight reveals something completely different. So if you hold this at an angle, you can actually see the outline of some sort of a rectangular thing right here. And then these were likely screw holes into the top that secured something because it like marred the finish. So I'm wondering if that was like a nameplate or something. I know that's something that occasionally happened on like 50s instruments. Someone would put like Rock and Robbie on it or something, you know, kind of like those custom made plates. So that's kind of what that looks like to me. And then maybe these splotches are like they glued it on top of screwing it to the edge. That's kind of interesting to see, but those are definitely touch up areas. Now this just more so looks like regular wear and tear to me, but our knobs are glowing the way I would expect to see on one of these things. And the rest of the finish is looking all right here as far as the top goes. So a little bit of something going on there that could have gave this guitar some history. Then our fretboard's looking all right here. And then our face of our headstock. Everything's looking pretty peachy, except for that one area that we already knew about. Now the back doesn't have too many mysteries for us. I mean, you got a couple of scratches and whatnot that wore through the clear coat. Edges are looking pretty nice on this one as well, even in our cutaway area. And it's always very important to blacklight the neck because you're looking for breaks, cracks, and repairs that seriously devalue a 50s Gibson if you happen to have it. But thankfully, this one looks good to me. Maybe some sort of a touch-up right here, but those tuners are even glowing pretty nicely. What a cool example. All said and done, surprisingly, this one's 10 pounds, 5 ounces. Like, it felt heavy, but it doesn't feel that heavy. But apparently it is. Scales don't lie. All right, let's go ahead and plug this thing in to get a tone demo. Is there anything cooler than this? <laughs> Bigsby three pickup black beauty. Looks cool whoever you are. Let's go ahead and give this some um, Jimmy Page flair just for fun. <laughs>
what a cool sounding guitar. So that neck pickup is so boisterous. When I first plugged this thing in, it was on the middle position. So I was kind of getting used to tones like these. Which I personally love out of these three pickup customs because it's just something you don't normally get in Gibson territory. But then I switched to this neck pick and I was like, whoa, Mud City. Nice and jazzy, deep, it's great. Now the bridge pickup, I had to raise it a little bit for my own personal taste. It was pretty low, but now it kind of sounds what I'm used to. Now let's kick on a little bit of dirt with this thing. Well, wasn't that just a fun treat, getting to play Jimmy Page stuff on a black Les Paul Custom from 1957, factory stock with a Bigsby. Now, did this thing like absolutely blow my mind? 
No, I mean, it's honestly it kind of hurt my back. It was so heavy, but it's such a cool piece of history. I mean, the feel, the smell, the looks, it is all exactly what I've been waiting to document for a very special episode. Now the pickups themselves, they're kind of microphonic, but I mean, that's to be expected. These things are not wax potted. Now you can wax pot them, but you're going to really hurt the value. And it was definitely manageable. I mean, I'm using my Marshall Blues Breaker at a relatively loud setting and it wasn't too untamely. If anything, you could probably get some interesting harmonic squeals and feedbacks with this thing. But all things considered, this thing is actually in pretty good shape. Now, if you were going to seriously gig this, I would probably suggest replacing these tuners. They're just not as tight as they really should be. But they definitely do the part for now if you just want to keep it original, but they make really great drop-in replacements to these tuners nowadays. I didn't think the bending was too bad on these fretless wonders, if we're being honest here, because there's a decent amount of life to these, but obviously not as easy as medium jumbos and whatnot. You're going to have to work for it a little bit more. But once again, big thank you to Jim over at Jam City Guitars. If you don't know what he does, he does a bunch of vintage restorations and conversion jobs. I mean, he's one of the top guys when it comes to things like that. So I'll go ahead and check him out on his website, jamcityguitars.com. And thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.